Stephen Pastis, looking up. Chapter 19. Exit through the gift swap. When I got back home, my mother's car was not yet in the driveway. So I crawled into bed even though I wasn't tired, thinking that if my mother suddenly came home, I could fake like I was sleeping and at least put off my punishment for another day. But maybe I was more tired than I'd thought, because when I opened my eyes, it was already morning. And I'd missed my mother again. And if her note was any indication, she had not yet heard what had happened. Missed you, sleepyhead. Breakfast on table. XO. And suddenly I felt like I was queen of the world. <sighs> Why? Because if my mother didn't know what had happened by that point, it meant Daniel's uncle was probably not going to tell her. And maybe that was because he wanted us to be on good terms. And the only reason he'd want that is if we were going to be neighbors for a long time. And that meant he had not yet sold the house. So maybe that couple had had second thoughts after all. I'm having second thoughts? All of which meant that Daniel wasn't going anywhere soon. And news like that can make a night walk with a certain spring in her step. And so I give an extra morning pat to each of my rescue animals. Pit, pit, pit. And said something to Dr. Rutherford B. Hayes that I should have said long ago. I'm sorry for dropping you off the roof like an orange. And after eating my breakfast, I even did the dishes. Because even though my mother hadn't found out what I'd done, I felt I owed her an apology too. And when you're doing that many kind things in a row, the universe often pays you back with some sort of gift. Sort of its way of saying, Way to go, kiddo. And when I walked outside, that gift was on my porch, along with a note. A beautiful cane for you, Daniel. And maybe this is the dumbest thing you've ever heard, but I actually hugged that cane. Because I don't know about you, but I never get gifts for no reason. They're pretty much limited to birthdays and special events. So for Daniel to think of me like that was probably the most extraordinary thing that had ever happened in my life. And it was so exciting that I missed the best part of the note, the P.S. on the back. P.S. Holding hands equals good. And I don't know if there was anyone around to see what happened next, but I actually started floating down my walkway. Which maybe you think is impossible, but it turns out that it is, and it made me want to write my own note back to Daniel, and I knew exactly what I wanted to say. Cat, stop loving you. Yeah. Which reminds me, I don't think I ever told you what Muffins did the last time I ever saw him, and if I did, stop me. Anyhow, I had gone to the store to just buy a book, which he slipped into a bag, and when he left, he said the same thing he always did, which was, Don't slam the darn door, dingo! But when I got home, I opened the bag with my book in it, and down at the bottom was the most beautiful night I'd ever seen, courtesy of Muffins, along with a note. Homework finito! And that's about the only other time I can ever remember somebody giving me a gift for no reason. Although I guess you could say it was sort of Muffins' goodbye gift, because he probably knew the store was going to get torn down and just didn't want to tell me. Anyhow, that's how Daniel's gift made me feel, only a hundred times better, which is why I was floating like a butterfly all the way across the street, right toward Daniel's house, where I saw something new atop their for sale sign. Something that made me see the cane for what it actually was. A goodbye gift. Chapter 20. Raising Cain. I can't tell you everything that happened next, because to tell you the truth, it's all a bit hazy. Sort of like that fog of war thing I read about in one of my night books, which was ironic because I was hurling every one of those nights against the wall of my room. Ksh! Which must have come as quite a surprise to them, kneeling as they were in hopeful prayer. And the dragons fared even worse, for after I threw them, I stomped on them for good measure. And for once, I was pretty sure they did not die of old age. And the dragons didn't even get the worst of it. That was saved for my helmet and shield, which I tore into just about a thousand pieces. And believe me, that sort of display is going to get noticed by your life partner, who rose from the water in his tank and did everything he could to calm me down. <sniffs> but I don't think I even heard what he was saying, because when you're lost in the fog of war, you miss a lot of things. And if you think all this sounds really bad, let me tell you right now that I haven't even gotten to the very worst part. And I know I've made a whole lot of mistakes and told you about most of them, but really, this was the very worst one. So if you want to stop reading right now, it's fine with me. Anyhow, it involved Daniel's cane. No, I, I didn't break it. Instead, I used it to break almost all the windows in his house. Ksh! Like the living room window. The kitchen window. And every other window I could reach with that cane. And after I was done, I threw the cane onto their front lawn and grabbed the sold sign, and ran as fast as I'd ever run down the middle of my street, past the remnants of punches, past the empty beefy bee, past the condescending gazes of the latte sippers, until I got to the creek, where in the light of day... Indifferent to all caution and sense, I lifted the sign high overhead and saw my mother. Chapter 21. Window to the Soul. The first thing I have to tell you is that my mother didn't just see the one sign I was holding. 
she saw all the signs. And the second thing I have to tell you is that she was not pleased. She was angry. So angry she didn't yell, but was silent. And silence can sometimes be the worst form of yelling. In fact, it wasn't until we were home and sitting in the kitchen that she even said a word. And when she did, she spoke softly. And that somehow made it worse. First she told me how hard it had been for her office to replace all those signs I had thrown into the creek, and how much money it had cost, and how frustrating it had been that it kept happening over and over, and to think, she went on, that the person who was causing all of it was living in her own house, and was her own daughter. Not some vandal in the neighborhood, her own daughter. A daughter that she cared for and loved. This was how I showed appreciation. And then the duck quacked. Quack, quack, quack. Not a real duck, but a phone duck. She had made it the ringtone of her phone once to make me giggle, but then she couldn't figure out how to change it back. I have to take this, she said, turning to the phone. Do not go anywhere. Then there was a long silence while she listened to whoever it was. No, I don't want to buy anything. No, I don't. No, I am not interested. No, I'm hanging up now. I'm hanging up. Goodbye. Stupid telemarketer, she said. I'm waiting for a call, so I had to take it. Then she turned back to me. Do you have any idea what my employer would do if they found out my daughter was the person stealing the signs? I didn't steal them, I objected. I just put them in the creek, which was just about the dumbest thing I could have said, because then she did start yelling. Do you think this is a game? And even though I knew it was wrong, I raised my voice too. You made punches disappear! I... I what? The toy store! They tore it down! They're gonna replace it with some stupid coffee shop! And how is that my fault? It was your company that sold it. What? Chuck, Les, they're the ones who sold it. Saint, there are a ton of agents in my office. I don't know all their listings. It was my favorite toy store. So this is about a toy store? It wasn't just a toy store. Saint, I'm very sorry they tore it down. But if you think you're going to get out of this by saying you were upset about a toy store, you are mistaken. It wasn't just a toy store. Everything is gone. Everything is changing. All the stuff I love, it's disappearing. Saint, that happens everywhere. Places go away. New places come. In every town. Everywhere. Wrong! What do you mean wrong? They happen because you make them happen. Saint, I'm a real estate agent. That's my job, she said, pointing to all the files that she kept in the kitchen, which she sometimes used as an office. I help people who want to sell homes and businesses, and I don't sell the properties. They do. And by the way, it's the income from that job that allows me to take care of you, for which you seem to have absolutely zero appreciation. But you're ruining everything. I'm not ruining anything. I don't even know what you're talking about. Do you have any idea how much money we owe? Hospital bills from the car accident that I'll be paying back for the rest of my life? So I have a job, Saint. A job that barely keeps us above water as it is. Can you understand any of that? But I want punches to be right where it was. Is that what this is about? Yes! I want punches back. Is that what this is about? She asked again. Yes, right on the corner where it was. Is that what this is about? She repeated, moving closer to me. I want things to be like they were. Is that what this is about? She said, grabbing me by the shoulders, her trembling face almost touching mine. And then I just started to sob and between sobs, said something I had never said to her before. I miss Dad. And when I said it, my mother grabbed me with both her arms and held me just about as tightly as I'd ever been held by anyone. I really miss him, I said again, and I just kept crying. I want everything to be like it was. And for a long time, neither one of us said a word, until finally my mom took my face in her hands and said, Saint, if there was anything I could do to change that and bring him back to this world, I would, but I can't. Oh, sweetie, I promise you, I would do anything. But I just kept crying. I miss all those Sundays he took punches. Oh, sweetie, she said, still holding me, rocking me. Oh, sweetie. And then, wouldn't you know it, the duck quacked again. Quack. Quack, quack. Ah! She grunted, grabbing the phone and trying desperately to make it stop, which she couldn't. So she flung it across the room, where it landed in the couch's cushions, which at least partially muffled the duck. Quack, quack, quack. Then she knelt once again in front of me. Saint, instead of doing all the stuff that you did, which was bad, really 
bad. You should have just talked to me. I wanted to, but I couldn't. What do you mean you couldn't? You're never home, I said. Baby, you know I work. But I'm by myself all the time. Not all the time, she said. I'm home at night. Well, a lot of the time. I'm sorry, sweetheart, but it's just me. I don't have anyone to help me. And I can't afford a nanny or even a babysitter. And I'm responsible for you, for working, for everything. I hate being alone. Sweetie, I'm doing the best that I can. It makes me sad. And I don't know if it was my admitting that or what, but then she paused, took a breath, and said, I'm sorry, and stroked the top of my head. I'm so sorry. And hugged me tighter. I will do better. She stroked my head again. I promise. I don't want you to be sad, sweetie. Not if I can help it. I'll do better. I promise you. And for a second... It looked like she was going to start bawling, too. And I didn't want us both to be bawling, so I tried to make her feel better. It's okay, I told her. I'm not always sad. I have Daniel. Then I added, at least for now. Who's Daniel? she asked. My friend. Have I met him? I don't think so. I don't think I've introduced him to anybody. Who is he? The boy across the street. Our street? Yes, I said, pointing toward the kitchen window. In the house right across from us. And then she just stared at me. And stood and walked to the kitchen window where she pulled open the blinds and turned back to me and said, Saint, there hasn't been a house there in ten years. Chapter 22 There's always a chance. Like soil enriched by a flood, sometimes good flows from bad. And as bad as getting caught by my mom was, the good that followed was better. Like how she stopped going to the office every other Tuesday, not to do errands or work from home, but to spend them with me. A promise she made with her hand on the pinata. And this time she meant it, and she made sure to spend time with Dr. Rutherford B. Hayes as well. Who, given his dislike of strangers, did not appreciate the immediate intimacy. Though I knew that in time Dr. Rutherford B. Hayes would love it, particularly as he now had double the audience for his wide-ranging sermons. Here's a dictionary for all the big words, which is not to say I wasn't punished for what I had done, and that meant cleaning my mom's office once a week for six months, for which I was given just enough money to buy a repair kit for my nights, their prayers for aid, finally answered, which was bad news for the dragons, who once again died of natural causes and poor hygiene like never before, failed to wash behind ears. As for Daniel, I think it all comes back to what he said in the attic. Ever notice how in a book or movie a character can be as real to you as someone you know in real life? Well, that's what Daniel was to me, as real to me as you are to yourself, or I am to you. And yes, the weed-filled lot across from us had been empty for a very long time, and was now for sale. It was on the first block torn down by the people buying up our town, though no one had built on it since. Except me. Which reminds me of something else Daniel told me that day in the attic. And that was how he'd gotten his nickname. Chance. And it involved one of the only clear memories he had of his father, who had told him one day, as long as you have your imagination in this life, you've got a chance. Which really wasn't what Daniel's father told Daniel. But what my father told me. And thus, I could have conversations with my turtle, and my rescue piñatas, and Daniel, who I now call Chance, all of whom were with me every day, for every moment alone, and every moment I walked through a changing life, and a changing city. And as I walked, I thought of Mrs. Trafaldi and all the change she had seen in her long life, however long that had been, and how she took comfort from the stars, and her cheese, which made me hungry and so I went looking for somewhere new to eat. And wouldn't you know it, maybe all that positive thought got noticed by the universe or something, because then I saw this, the Beefy Bee, grand reopening, under new management. How that happened? I had no idea, and didn't much care. All I knew was that the Beefy Bee was back, and while there was no more sparrow to be found at the order window, there was someone even better. And I'm telling you, when I saw muffins in that window... I wanted to hug his grumpy head right there. Though he probably would have shut the window on my fingers, so instead I just ordered fries. And I have to say, they were quite good. For Muffins was almost as good at frying potatoes as he was at finding nights. And I was sure that one day, as he got better, he would serve me not only the fries I wanted, but the fries I needed. Though his habit of spitting seeds while cooking would not be sanctioned by any reputable health department. Ptwee. Ping, ping. And the best part was that Muffins didn't seem to care about how long I sat at the new square tables outside, or that I put Dr. Rutherford B. Hayes on top of one of them so he could read the Sunday literary supplement. And by the time my life partner was done reading, 
It was already night, and so we walked home, the night with her trusty steed. And while I may not have been victorious in my battle against the latte sippers, I had fought with enough honor to dub myself Guardian of the Sacred Piñata, a title I wore with pride as I made my way home, a moment so perfect I knew that'd have to be a car alarm. Only there wasn't. There was just a faint cry in the distance. Gosh darn baby bell! And that's the thing about life. Sometimes it lets a beautiful moment just be. As we looked up at the stars, the past always present. The end. Special thanks to Karen Papraki for all her wonderful help with the cover design for this book and to Kara Sargent for being the best editor ever. Stephen Pastis is the creator of the syndicated comic strip Pearls Before Swine, which appears in over 800 newspapers. He is also the creator of the Timmy Failure book series and the co-writer of Disney Plus movie Timmy Failure, Mistakes Were Made. He lives in Northern California with his wife and two kids.